Well, thank you, Mr. Star Wars, and uh, good afternoon to all of you and, and those on the webcast. We welcome you as well. This is a nice room, about the right size. We almost fill it. But I do have a, a, a what do you call it, a complaint, I guess. The, the lighting up here isn't very good, and you couple that with my bad eyesight. So I might be guessing on some of the things I tell you. No, I won't really. I think I can read this. Well, here we are on Sunday morning, or Sunday afternoon, I guess, and uh, observing the third Feast of Seven, uh, Feast of Pentecost. So today I want to speak about uh, about Pentecost, but in a, in a different way than probably you've heard before, because I want to talk about the, uh, the future of first fruits, because this is this is also called the Feast of First Fruits. My title <clears throat> is Pentecost and the Future of First Fruits. The Jews call this, uh, this, this holy day has several names. You can find them in the, New, in the Old Testament, several names it goes by. Uh, the Jews call it Shavuot, Shavuot, three, three syllables. Some people try to make it two syllables, but it's Shavuot. And that just means weeks because the alternate way of counting it is to count seven weeks and then the next day is Pentecost. So today is the 50th day. And it's also called the uh, Feast of Harvest and the Feast of First Fruits. And that's what I want to dwell on is called the Feast of First Fruits. One of the surprising things is uh, the New Testament writers, out of the blue, without any explanation, called this holy day. Pentecost, and uh, you could you could search the Old Testament from you know beginning to end, and you won't find the word Pentecost in the Old Testament. And uh, oh, by the way, uh, do you know the, it's the you know Pentecost comes from the Greek? Do you know the Greek word that we we call Pentecost? Anybody? You don't know the Greek word? <laughs> Oh, yes, you really do. <laughs> the, the Greek word is Pentecost. <laughs> it, Pentecost is a Greek word. The, the only difference is uh, it's spelled a little differently. Uh, in Greek, you, so, you spell it uh, P-E-N-T-E-K-O-S-T-E. -E. You put an E on the end of it. And in Greek, it's uh, pronounced Pentecosti. And... Uh, so that, that word doesn't appear in the Hebrew Old Testament, but it does appear in the Greek Old Testament. But it's never used to reference this day. In the, in the Greek Old Testament, it means 50th. 50th. And uh, back in the old days, we used to say Pentecost means count 50. It doesn't mean that, but I mean, it's okay to say that because... Pentecost means the result of counting 50. It's 50th. Anyway, that's neither here nor there, really. But I would like to turn to uh, Leviticus 23. And uh, I suppose you're not surprised. Yesterday we, uh, we had Mr. Beatty have, a, have us turn to Leviticus 23. And... Uh, Beginning in the first 15, we read about this holy day. It says in verse 15, You shall count for yourself from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephod and they shall be an ephod two, two tenths ephod according to uh, some references is about eight cups about eight cups of uh, flour and uh, 
Let me find my place here. They shall be baked. They shall be of fine flour. Fine flour. Not just any flour. Fine flour. And they shall be baked with leaven. And that's kind of surprising because normally anything referenced to an offering doesn't have leaven in it. But these, these loaves do. So, you know, people like to speculate, why two loaves? Why not one loaf? Why not five loaves? You know, and uh, I'm not going to speculate on that today, but uh, there were two loaves. You know, it says in verse 17, you shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephod. And I wondered, what does that mean, from your dwellings? Well, I think this is a general term, and it just means from your crops from your crops. And uh, so I uh, I was curious about I wonder how they did that back then. How did they how did they determine for example it, who who goes to the field and, and and harvests this and and what do they do with it and how the mechanism works. Well, I did find a, a Jewish authority which says that First of all, the wheat, uh, first of all, it is wheat. It's not barley. It's, it's the second, second harvest of grain. It's wheat, not barley. And it must be from the best wheat from the fields. And it has to be the first fruits from the field. And the Jews claim that uh, it must be sifted 12 times. What they, do, what they do is they grind it into, uh, I assume they grind it into flour, and then they sift it 12 times. And that brought up another question. Do, well, do, do they have sifts of different size? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't check into that. But anyway, that's, that's their idea of obeying when it says it must be fine flour. It's sifted 12 times. So whether or not that's the way God intended, I don't know. Sometimes God tells, told Israel to do certain things, and He let them determine how to do, how to do what they were to do. You know, when I read about that sifting twelve times, I instantly thought of Luke twenty-one thirty, thirty-one. You don't need to turn there, where. Where Satan, or I mean, Jesus said to Peter, says, Satan would like to sift you like wheat. That's what he said, the exact word. Satan would like to sift you like wheat. And that reminded me that we as Christians are sifted, you know, in, in a sense. You know, we, you know, life isn't an easy, easy thing sometimes. Sometimes we have difficulties and trials. And also James 1.18 says, uh, uh, says we are a kind of first fruits. And I don't know why he said kind of, but someday I'm going to check into that. I did a little checking into it and I have a theory, but I'm not going to mention that now. So, uh, like I said, people like to speculate why two loaves. The Jews say, well, that's, that's, that's because Israel split. And I don't quite buy that. Uh, I, 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 personally, I think it's Old Testament uh, patriarchs and New Testament Christians. I, but it could be something else. I don't know. We're not told. That's, that's the main thing. We're not told. So what are first fruits going to be doing in the future? What, what are you and I going to be do, doing in the future? Well, it's for certain that we're going to be in a leadership role. There's no doubt about that. Remember the scripture, which says, uh, I think I referenced it somewhere, but in, in Isaiah, Isaiah 30, verse 20 says, you shall hear a voice behind you. This is the way, walk you in it. And so that voice comes from, from us. And we know that, but, but that's another story. So, 
I came across, I, I didn't come across, I heard about a, a, Gallup, a Gallup poll that was done a few years ago. And that poll wanted to find out what are the characteristics of a good leader. And uh, they, they polled about 10,000 people. And they, they uh, came down to four basic things. And these are the characteristics of a good leader. Trust, compassion, stability, and hope. Trust, compassion, stability, and hope. And when I read that, I said, hmm, that sounds like that's the characteristics of God. <laughs> you know, God, who can you trust more than God? Who is more compassionate than God? Who is more stable than God? And only God gives us real hope. So anyway, I'd like to just quickly run through those characteristics and uh, tell you what I found in the, in the scriptures. I searched the word trust in the English uh, uh, Bible, and it's used 125 times. And often it's referring to God. The Old Testament says many, many times, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord. Even in the Old Testament, that's what it said. Trust in the Lord. And that's what we do. Psalm 62, verse 8, you don't need to turn there. It says, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. So, we do trust in God. That is our, that is our only, only leader that we can trust in is God. The second thing, compassion, the word compassion wasn't used that many times. It's used about 47 times. And uh, there's an alternate word that means compassion. That's mercy. Mercy and compassion are basically the same feeling. And Psalm 145 verse 8 says, The Lord is precious and full of compassion. Full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. So there again, that shows that these characteristics belong to God. And if we if we want to be a good leader, then we we need to uh, have those characteristics. Speaking of compassion, my, uh, Matthew nine thirty six. Uh, speaking of Jesus, it says, But when he, that is Jesus, saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them, because they, they were weary and scattered and sheep having no shepherd. So, so Jesus had much compassion. The word mercy is used over 300 times in the, old, in the, in the, the entire Bible in the uh, of course, mercy, as I said, is just like uh, compassion. The other, uh, the, the next, the next uh, characteristic is stability. And that word, not used very often, a few times. But uh, stability means sameness, you, you know, uh, unchanging. Hebrews 13, 8 is probably a, a, a memory scripture. Hebrews 13, 8 says, uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And uh, how's that for stability? Matthew and Malachi 3 6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. And so we can trust God to never change. And the last one, hope. Uh, hope is uh, used very often, it's used 140 times. And I'd just like to read one uh, verse having to do with that. I, I can't, I don't think I could read 140 verses in, in my allotted time. First Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope. We have a hope unlike 
other people's hope, a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So these are characteristics that we need to try to emulate. We really do, and we all know we fall short, but we need to strive for that anyway. So let me conclude by just saying this. The uh, attitudes of a good leader are, are, are the attitudes that we need, the characteristics that we need. And uh, so we should uh, remind us, of re that reminds us of the, re of the responsibility of the first fruits that's going to come our way. And I don't, I don't subscribe to the uh, idea that we can learn all these things in this life to, to learn how to be a leader in the world beyond today. I don't, I don't, I think when we have, when we're changed into spirit, we will know, we will know those things. But in this life, we need to uh, work on those things and, and see if we can emulate God in that way. So uh, I hope you uh, have a wonderful Feast of Pentecost and, uh, we all will eventually become leaders like Jesus Christ.